Good evening, and welcome back to the Masonic Roundtable, a weekly hangout of Masons from around the world who get together to talk about Masonic news and opinions in a friendly and social manner. The standard disclaimer applies for this episode. The thoughts and opinions expressed here are solely the opinions of the participants and do not um, reflect any Grand Lodge statements or positions. Please keep your conversations open to the public and on the level for this episode. Uh, tonight, as usual, you can interact with us uh, by sending us a tweet at Mason Roundtable at our Twitter handle or uh, posting on the Facebook event page, and we'll get to social media later in the episode. Uh, as far as introductions are concerned, my name is Jason Richards, and I am the junior warden of Acacia Lodge number 16 in good old Clifton, Virginia. John, you next. Thank you, Jason. I see you have a few others that I assume you will introduce later. So with that, that is correct. Uh, my name is John Ruark. I'm a past master of the Patriot Lodge number 1957 in super awesome Fairfax, Virginia. Ish. And I'll hand it off to Robert Johnson. And you're muted, Robert, so let's let's fix I that was first. I'm totally muted in prep for the show. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Uh, Robert Johnson here from Waukegan, Illinois, uh, the current Worshipful Master of Waukegan Lodge number 78 in up-and-coming again Waukegan, Illinois. Twice in one era. Yeah, right. one. How about you, Nick? Hi, uh, Nick Johnson, past master of Corinthian Lodge number 67 in Big Time Farmington. Thank you, Nick. And Juan? Hello, everybody. Juan Sepulveda here from Kissimmee, Florida, member of Orange Blossom Lodge number 80, and the host of the Winding Stairs Freemasonry podcast. All right. And now back to you, Jason. Uh, yes. Uh, so this is our episode on American co-masonry. And I'd like to turn it over to uh, uh, Brother Matthias first to introduce himself and, and what he is with the order. Uh, thank you, uh, Jason. Um, my name is Matthias Kumsia. I'm the past master of uh, Enoch Lodge number 19 out of uh, Salt Lake City. And uh, currently I'm the uh, president of the Grand Council of Administration. Um, basically I'm the uh, glorified uh, office manager of the Honorable Order of American Co-Masonry. <clears throat> And then uh, our second guest with us uh, is Brother Karen Kidd. Yes. Please introduce yourself. I'm Karen Kidd. I am Right Worshipful Master of Shemesh Lodge <laughs> number 13 under, dis excuse me, under Dispensation Meeting in the Orient of Seattle, Washington, and I've written some books. Some pretty fantastic books, actually. Very good. All Masonic news, then. Uh, we have quite, quite a bit this week, so let's get right to it. Um, again, if you have not registered yet, the clock is ticking. Jason and I will be at the 6th Annual MRF Symposium, that's the Masonic Restoration Foundation Symposium, at the Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania in the city of brotherly love, Pennsylvania. And so that will be at the end of August. Hope to see you there. Uh, you can check out show notes and or go to MasonicRestorationFoundation.org on how to register uh, to Go to that, so hope to see you there. And, uh, John, we will actually have a table with the vendors at the MRF Symposium. So come and say hi. Come and talk to us about the show. We will give you some bookmarks and bring your Masonic passports because if you've ever gotten a thank you card from us, we hand emboss all of our thank you cards, and I will have that embosser with me, and I will give you a stamp in your Masonic passport for TMR. <clears throat> nice. So... There's a little something you could take away that no one else has. <laughs> All right, the next topic that we have is uh, something that uh, I saw and Jason saw um, about the Orange County uh, Freemasons. Uh, why don't you talk about that a little bit, Jason? Oh yeah, there was a uh, there was a really cool article on um, the Orange County California Freemasons that are staging a comeback thanks to millennials and it's talking about the the growth of of Masonic um, organizations in in California with the resurgence uh, of kind of the, the millennial generation uh, becoming much more interested in in masonry after the the baby boomers uh, you know kind of went to other ways with that so it was a really neat article and it's been shared around social media What's I got great about that is the lodge in Orange County, California. And Orange Circle is the lodge that I first walked up to, and I was actually going to uh, petition there 
but I chickened out like a punk. <laughs> <laughs> but it was so cool because right next door to it is like an old school barber shop, and uh, it, it's such a cool place down in or- Orange, uh, in Orange Circle down there, or- Old Town Orange, California. And uh, so if you guys are ever walking around and you're in California, you're in the California area, stop by there. It's really cool. I did really like the uh, the opening statement. I was going to say that. About, uh, that's where we sacrificed the goats because I was actually at the Grand Lodge <laughs> of New York a couple weeks ago and I got to play tour guide because the tour guide didn't show up. And uh, there was actually a, a point where one of the people was like, so where do you sacrifice the virgins? And I pointed to the altar and I just went on like a, a five-minute diatribe about how we're getting away from virgins because they're really hard to find, and then the goats were just messy, so now it's more symbolic, and it, it was just awesome. From operative to speculative, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <clears throat> so that happened. Now we just let them watch a video. <laughs> <laughs> and I refer you back to the Baphomet episode last week. Uh, Northern uh, Masonic Jurisdiction Sacrificial Video. Yes. <laughs> That's great. <clears throat> All right, uh, next topic we have, unless there's any other discussion, is on the, uh, let's see what we got here, the Short Talk Bulletins. Uh, for those who know about the Masonic Service Association, uh, there has been a brother who has taken upon himself, uh, under the authority of the Masonic Service Association, to go back and record audio <clears throat> of the old Short Talk Bulletins. Uh, and Isn't so, that basically the Whence Came You Masonic podcast? Yeah, <laughs> take hey, take it all paper, <laughs> dust it off, <laughs> and read it. And not, not to take anything away from the MSA, they do some fantastic things with this, but I just want to say, you know, if you don't want to give anything per year, you can just watch or you can listen to my show, and maybe you'll get a MSA, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's really funny, you know, reading this article because they they say that, you know, paying for this and supporting this goes directly to support the MSA, but they crouch it in a way where it's supporting the ideals and values of the MSA, and it doesn't say anything about supporting the MSA monetarily. No, if you're really? going to... Oh, if you're going to record these these short talk bulletins and this inter- intellectual property, uh, you know, I want to make sure that the money that's generated from it is actually going back into the MSA. Yeah, for sure. Well, if you want to do that, then you got to buy the, the little starter pack that John didn't like. What's the starter pack? <laughs> that pack of books that you didn't enjoy. <laughs> well, that's, that's true. <laughs> that's true. Yeah, the, you know, the, the one they sold. Uh, we've talked about that on a previous episode about their, uh, <laughs> their Masonic Speakers pack. That's it. Yeah, that's what it was. Oh, yeah, that's right. Uh, you know, so, so how do you guys feel about this? Uh, charging money for basically recording uh, public domain stuff. I don't know. It, it, again, I'm with you, Jason. If I knew it was if it was directly going to a good cause, uh, you know, I could upscale that. Uh, I did check it out. Uh, the audio is high quality. <clears throat> it is well recorded, so there's not a lot of uhs and ums and all that mixed in. Uh, but definitely want to uh, consider how often he's going to update this. It, they, they do go through a, a an app called... Gum Road, that's mm. basically a content app, <clears throat> and so you'll you'll get all the updates inside of that app. What's what's kind of interesting, I think, about that whole idea is um, giving money to support them. If it was going to them, like you said, uh, I would feel good with that uh, because obviously you can't run an organization like the MSA for free. Um, but ultimately, I feel like it kind of comes down to. Uh, if you really want to provide it, you can just provide it. And I think that's what they did it, the way they did it was listen for nothing or, or you know, give a dollar. Uh, it was like when Wentz came, you came to a point where the people that provided the app for us, uh, it was going to continue to be $2 for somebody to buy the app. And you could support the show that way. But the way they changed it was actually that if we were going to continue with the paid app, it was going to be a subscription service for the listeners. Now, personally, I couldn't ask all the listeners to pay $2 every month for access to the show unlimited. Um, While I think if my time is well worth that $2, yeah, absolutely. But the craft gave me something I'm giving back. My two cents. 
Yeah, yeah in, in that case, it, it would be. Want. In that case, it, it's a bait and switch. You're trapping them free and then switching it on them and charging. Yeah. I, I, you know me. I have, for, I, I think about this differently. Yeah, uh, I think you brothers are looking at it in a certain way. If, if it's a company or if it's an individual who has to take out of his time to record this, and he's gonna take the time to to record it. If some money goes to him, so so be it. It's not like they're charging a specific amount for them, right? Yeah, it's pay as I, you I see will. Pay there. as you wish, right? Exactly. You know, it's it's the whole it's the cold play model, right? Yeah, I'm I'm fine if zero dollar zero dollars go to to the Masonic. Uh, Association, zero dollars go to it, and all the money goes to help someone take time of their life to record these in high quality so the rest of the craft can benefit from it. I support it. I don't see a problem with that. There you go. Do you think you know Juan's opinion. Is That's my opinion. At, at the, at the oh, sorry, Juan, we, we lost you there. Like, yeah. <laughs> like, all right. Yeah. Because we can't, we, the thing is this we can't have it both ways. You know, he, we, we complain about lodges having the crappiest websites and the most, you know, they have a website up for a month or for a year and then it goes down to nothing. No one maintains it. Yeah, because someone's doing it for free. How long are they going to do it for free? You know, we want something that looks nice. I bet you there's people on a payroll at the uh, Freemasonry magazine from California, which is the, one of the most beautiful looking magazines. I bet you someone's getting money from that. Sure. So one one thing that I, I did, and I'll, a full disclosure, I, I put the zero dollars in just to see what the quality was like. I, I, I want to find a way if I can go back and actually up that a little bit um, because it is high quality and is, is done with care. So um, Is it done in 320 kilobytes per second dual channel stereo? Dude, no <laughs> compression. It's awesome. It, <laughs> well, <laughs> All hey, right. we, should, uh, we should move on and talk we about have, some guy dressing up as a Templar. We have beat that dead horse. So speaking of, of riding dead horses, uh, we've got <laughs> <laughs> we've got a guy who likes to dress up himself. Let's talk about this. The uh, uh, man dons Knight Templar costume to scare away Muslims from a New York military recruiting center. <laughs> Apparently sh shootings at recruiting centers are uh, a common thing. Unfortunately, not anymore. <laughs> but but if you if you approach this guy, uh, you'll you'll think twice. So <laughs> yeah, why it's is this fill in the blank to bring a sword to a gunfight? It, 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 like... <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I think this guy might actually yeah. encourage people, you know, like to, to do Makes something. Makes sense to me. Yep. Well, and, and as Karen was mentioning, she's like, that's not a Knights nice Templar costume. He's got the flag. Yeah. <laughs> he doesn't have the poodle hat. That's, That's the problem. <laughs> you have to have the menacing poodle hat. You should have a it's, it's totally a, a Ren Fair knockoff, but yeah. Hey man, we just got back from the Ren Fair. I got sweet killed. I've actually made a Knight Templar costume. Really? Yes. Alrighty. <clears throat> That's awesome. <laughs> <One in the book. laughs> so now you can uh, start hanging out outside of recruiting centers. Then. No, I don't. It wasn't for me. It was for somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> for someone else. To yes. dodge bullets. And, and, he, look at has, and like, he has Nick's worn it to lunch. Oh, and Nick, what, do you, what have you got there? Oh, that oh, is your Knight Templar. Nick's chapeau. His chapeau? Handsome. Handsome Nick. Oh. That Nick doesn't even <clears throat> use because they have their Class A's. That's right. So uh, do keep in mind, guys, that for those listeners of the show, yes, we will be doing a Knight's Templar episode eventually. <laughs> and we'll see all of Nick's many hats <clears throat> and swords. <laughs> So yeah, so a bit back back to the uh, the Knight Templar dude. Um, good for him, but that's that's really the, the loosest connection to Freemasonry there. Yep. Uh, I, I don't know if he's a Mason. It's still <clears throat> kind of hilarious. Well, one thing though is like I don't know if you noticed at the uh, Freemasonry group, the the Whitey Stitch Freemasonry group, some people were really <clears throat> offended that I put that uh, that post up. Really? Because I put and in Templar news, and I put the link. That was it. Discussed. Discuss amongst yourselves, <laughs> and people, a, a lot of brothers became very angry. Like, what does this have to do with Freemasonry? Other people were very uh, boisterous about the fact. Well, people are going to be thinking bad about the fraternity now that this man is doing that. So you have two camps. You have people that were completely convinced that we are directly related to the, <laughs> to the Knights Templar, and thus making this a Masonic news. 
and other people that said this has nothing to do with masonry. How dare you put this on your own page? Wow. Already. <clears throat> A lot of people learn it, including me. So let's see. The last thing I want to get to tonight before we get into the meat and potatoes is the the big news about our old buddy Baphomet. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> this uh, you, you guys couldn't make this up, and you couldn't have done it any sooner. Um, let's talk about Baphomet. Um, oh, in yeah. Detroit this week, right after our episode, yes, we had something to do with it, apparently, is uh, the new statue unveiling in, in Detroit of the Satanic Temple's secret Baphomet monument unveiling. You can see a nice picture there of Baphomet with uh, two children who are... Very happy to be there, hanging out with him, <laughs> as most children are. Uh, you know, it's it's so it's, awkward. It is awkward. It really is. So but, Art de Hoyos. I want a mini You guys see it? Yeah, Art de Hoyos posted about it. It it, it quickly made it made its way around the uh, uh, the Masonic forums. Uh, but I mean, it, it's it's really interesting, and most of the the comments I've seen really relate back to it's really. I wouldn't say ironic that basically that the 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 U.S. Satanists Satanists have actually taken Baphomet as a symbol and icon for for the Satanic Church when it really has has a very 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 loose connection to what they they, well, they truly believe. It, it, any any horrible group, and I'm not saying Satanists are horrible people because most of them are just plain old people who are atheists, but they're trolls. <laughs> you you get a troll around, you know. So, but uh, look at like uh, any organization who adopts a symbol that's viewed upon negatively, they can take it, and now all of a sudden it's evil for everybody, right? Uh, so, yeah, whatever. But I was. Did you read? Two hundred people showed up for the unveiling. It was huge. Big party. I, was, I was there. Yeah, and they they sold tickets well, to it actually. Is, this is the tr- so, so if you're I mean, if you're what it is. They're, they're, they're like, you know what? Satan's going to get us there. You know, you know, if your lodge, lodge needs a uh, fundraising event, <laughs> roll out your own statue. Well, Nick and I were both there. We had pancakes beforehand. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Alrighty. I think, I think we've definitely uh, oh, man. killed that dead horse. So, uh, speaking of, a, of other depressing satanic news, Nick, why don't you lead us off with the Masonic Monday question? <laughs> On Tuesday. On Tuesday. Welcome to hell. <laughs> anyway. All right. How bad am I? Am I le- lagging for bad? Anyway. Yeah, doesn't you matter. Are. All right. The answer uh, Samuel Colt. Good old Sam Colt, who was famous for patenting the revolving cylinder pistol and also the assembly line model for its production, using interchangeable parts. And we had a whole bunch of people, <clears throat> interestingly enough, most of you guys said you despise guns. Just kidding. Uh, but anyway, uh, I will read off the names really quickly. Christopher Croteau, Justin Miller, uh, Greg Guffey, Willem Kosin. Uh, there we go. Uh, Robert Johnson. Well, who's that guy? Slacker. Jared Chemensky, uh, Simon Dick, huh? I said Cowan. Uh, Christopher Dorset, Jared C- Chapman, Dale Allen, Lou Bedford, Steve Higdon, Daniel Sells, Carl Walker, Joey Bo- Bower, Ted Service, James Webb, Dustin Fields, Kevin Schwartz, Josh Ney, Will Fowler, Walter Zalea, Shane Cody, Chris Eckert, the second, Kyle Rowe, Luke Zale, Johnny Z, Jonathan Primo, and then two under the wire guys, and it's taken forever to get there. Uh, but you know who you are. No, just kidding. Uh, we have. Blake Miles Leach and Joseph Land. So great job, guys. All right, now we'll get into the question. Make it harder next time. Oh man. Well, yeah. This this one was a little. This one's a little bit more tough. So, Masonic Monday question for the week of July twenty seventh, two thousand fifteen. 
Albert Magnus, or Albert the Great, was a Dominican friar, bishop, and learned scholar during the Middle Ages. Because of his extensive writings on Aristotle, chemistry, astronomy, he was elevated to fabled status. Many alchemical writings were attributed to him, to him as well as many legends of dubious origin. One such legend involved the designing and construction of this cathedral. The legend says that Albert Magnus was visited by four men carrying four implements of architecture and design, after which the Virgin Mary appeared, and the four men laid out their work for Albert Magnus. And it is with this design that the cathedral was constructed. Your question, which cathedral is Albert Magnus said to have designed, and what four implements were the men of his vision carrying? When you have an answer, send it to MasonicMonday at gmail.com. Don't forget to include your lodge name, your lodge number, and the hashtag uh, Magic Man. Back to you, Jason. Uh, hey, back to you, John. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> hey, you said you're running this thing. <clears throat> no, no, no. Let's uh, let's get started. So, yeah, home masonry. This is this is a show that we've wanted to do uh, since basically the beginning of the Masonic Roundtable because it's it's a very interesting branch of masonry about which the vast majority of of mailcraft masons out there know very little. So yeah. this this is a a great opportunity to to shed some light on something that's that's just really neat. Um, so John, I will turn it over to you to start the discussion. All right, so as usual, I like to start broad and work my way in. So I'm going to start broad. Define it. What is co-masonry? Karen? Uh, Matthias? You want to do it? Oh, I'll do it. Okay. Well, to me, it is the intentional inclusion of both genders in watch. All right, there you have it. Good night, everybody. <laughs> uh, no, so this is really fascinating because... Um, where did it re really come from, at least from American aspects? Because we've talked in the past about uh, you know, unrecognized or, or as we in mainstream male craft masonry call it, clandestine orders, that there really is a big spinoff uh, in France when they relaxed the requirements for a belief in a supreme being as well as uh, males only. Um, how, how did it really make its way into the American uh, co-masonry movement? Can you explain Just a little bit of that? Just to jump in, um, the uh, development of co-masonry has only a glancing um, anything to do with the Grand Orient, and um, they they uh, didn't uh, they didn't attempt to go co-masonic co until the last few years. Hmm. Um, I think what you're referring to is the initiation of Marie de Rem at, at Le Pec, and that was not a lodge of the Grand Orient of France. That was a lodge of the um, uh, I don't do French well. <laughs> Grand Loge, um, Grand Loge, uh, uh, can't remember if it's Ecosse, uh, symbolic or symbolic Ecosse, but it was a small Grand Lodge that had been part of the Grand Orient, and this is where the glancing part comes from. They okay. had withdrawn from the Grand Orient over um, the Grand Orient dropping requirement for a supreme being. And so the Grand Lodge, the, the, the Scottish Grand Lodge, <laughs> This one way of dis, uh, describing that Grand Lodge uh, broke over that. However, Lepec had developed in its bylaws that it presented to its Grand Lodge that they would initiate women, and the Grand Lodge said no. Uh, we'd rather you not do that, and so Lepec withdrew and was operating as a free lodge when they initiated Marie de Rem. Okay, and and so you guys fall under that that lineage uh, there. Well, the lineage, yes. But okay. we can we can um, we can um, track our lineage way back the same as you can. Because that's what I was going to ask: is is mainstream masons have a, a hard and fast? You know, we can trace all the way back to the mothership, the Grand Lodge of England, 2017, right around the corner. See you there. Can we? <laughs> <laughs> so so can you describe under what authority, what Grand Lodge trace do you have, and how do you, how can you trace back to England per se? Pretty much the same way you do. Um, the Grand Orient of France can tra trace its origins back to the, uh, to the Grand Lodge of England. And in fairness, really, you're going back to the Grand Lodge of Scotland. I'm more of a kill-winning girl. <laughs> um, and so we come, 
if you follow the lineage, we can trace to the Grand Orient of France, the Grand Orient can tra trace back to the Grand Lodge of England. There's a whole lot of stops in between, but that's where it is. Mm -hmm. And so basically just politics over the years have really kind of separated some of that. Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, well, yeah. Masonic <laughs> politics are always interesting. <laughs> Tell me about it. <laughs> so can I ask uh, just a quick question? Because like John, completely, um, I know a little bit about co-masonry, but on the whole, completely ignorant. Um, does the, and, I, and I'm sure we'll get into this, but as far as the ability to bring women and men into the craft equally, it does the the stigma about bringing a woman into the lodge, was that just, a, in your opinion, like an old uh, reasoning, you know, like it's a man's world, you know, like when women got the, the right to vote, and you know we got equality, that kind of thing. Was it an equality factor that you th you felt that women weren't allowed in the lodge, or I felt? <laughs> How do you feel? I I'm just I don't know. Um, well, if you look at look at it historically, women were initiated into otherwise male craft lodges in the 18th century, but over the course of that century, uh, the belligerence against this became more pronounced. And by the end of that century, they were pretending that it had never happened. Right. But there is no point in the history of the modern craft where there isn't at least one woman Freemason somewhere in the world. Before Marie Durham's initiation, uh, it was more of an accident. And what is sort of a paradox about the earliest women Freemasons, by the way, my first book was about that. Uh, so you know what you're talking about. Good. I do. Uh, <laughs> Um, the earliest women uh, Freemasons of the modern era, we're not talking about the operative uh, women Freem or women Masons, um, they were oddly male craft Masons. Uh, when I look at their stories, almost to every one of them, they are they're exceptions. There was something exceptional about each woman who was initiated. There was a reason they were initiated, but it was understood that there would be no attempt to, in to initiate other women into the lodge. And so, oddly, they lived their lives masonically as best they could, some were more successful than others, as male craft masons. This is mm -hmm. why I said my definition of co-masonry is the intentional initiation right. of both ah. genders in a lodge. Because uh, those early women Freemasons really can't be called co-masons. Right, they're exceptions to the rule, essentially. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Could you give us uh, an idea of what some of these exceptions might have been at the time? I, I quite a few, many. Uh, my favorite is actually uh, Catherine Babington. My second book was, which is not here, uh, was actually about her. She had been um, her uncle's. This was during. There's a there's a whole book on this, so I'm trying not to take too long. Uh, but her uncles were operating a lodge in Boyd County, what is now Boyd County, Kentucky. Then it was Greenup County, Kentucky. And this was during the anti-Masonic period. Okay. And it was kind of dangerous to be a Freemason at that point. Uh, but they were operating a lodge in Boyd County under the uh, Grand Lodge of Kentucky as best as it could exist at that point. And they found out that Catherine, who at this point was 17, uh, had been watching for the better part of a year and wow. had picked up all the word signs and grips. She was very well educated. And um, they, they apparently sequestered her in her bedroom while they contacted the Grand Lodge of Kentucky. And this being the, um, the, the anti-Masonic period, the Grand Lodge of Kentucky had other things to worry about. So they told her uncles, you will deal with her. You know, this is your niece. Leave us alone. So the uncles decided on their own that since she was not obligated to keep these secrets, that she needed to be. So they initiated, passed, and raised her all in one day. Kind of like modern male craft masons. <laughs> Ooh, and... <laughs> burn, burn. Hey, we have our own history of doing it, too, so it isn't just you. See but... <laughs> our one-day conferral episode. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, after that, she never went to Lodge again. Uh, but her son later, wrote, in the early part of the 20th century, wrote her biography. She, what I was referring to earlier, she lived her life as best she could uh, as a male craft mason. But she never, she never advocated for the inclusion of women in general in Freemasonry. She recognized herself as an anomaly. And she'd been a teenager. She was really too young. I mean, even as a Lewis, uh, it isn't clear if her father was a Freemason. 
Uh, he was he was he died when she was a child, uh, but she was too young even for a Lewis. But this is you know I think her uncles were very concerned that she be obligated. So this is an example of uh, an exception. Well, that that's fascinating. <clears throat> okay, so um, so you guys are are right there at the uh, the co-masonry headquarters, right? In, in uh, yes, we are. We're we're in Larkspur, and actually, Matthias, you can jump Let's in on this. Talk you know, about where you know. are and, and how you're structured there. So we're in uh, Larkspur, Colorado. It's a very small town south of Denver, Colorado, in between uh, Denver and Colorado Springs. Uh, this has been our headquarters for um, more than a hundred years, or approximately a hundred years. Well, more than a hundred. We uh, yeah. well. Is it well, 1916 is when uh, we actually moved here. So actually next year will be our 100th yeah. year. But it will be, uh, the founding of co-masonry was in 1903. It just took a while for us to get to Larkspur. So this headquarters, uh, the building we're in right now, is um, it's on the National uh, Registry for Historic Buildings. It was uh, finished in 1924, uh, uh, and it's still our central headquarters. It's a, it's a small campus, so we have an administrative building, which is this older building. Uh, we have a grand temple, which we have in um, you know, our grand lodge room. We have uh, special temples for the 18th degree, the 30th degree, uh, and for the 33rd degree. And we have a small like motel uh, for members that come here since it's very remote. And, so so uh, wait a minute. I heard you talk about more degrees than just the three degrees. Uh, do you also have appendant bodies? Well, we do things a little different in, uh, in our co-masonic order. So... Um, we have something called the Comasonic Rite, and the Comasonic Rite is the first three degrees, and we do an emulation-type ritual. And on top of that, we have the fourth to the 33rd degree. But they're not separate structures. They're one structure. So we do the first to the 33rd degree, including some of the English Rite degrees. So we do the Mark degree of the Royal Ark Mariner, and the Holy Royal Arch of Jerusalem, and it's in one consecutive ladder. So as a member of our order, uh, you have to go one degree at a time. So you have to take the first degree, second degree, third degree, then you take the English right degrees of the Mark, Royal Arch, Royal Arch, and then you take the 14th, the 18th, the 30, 32nd, and 33rd. So you, you can't just decide where you're going and, and what you're doing. You, you, you move up sequentially. And so you actually awesome. participate in every single degree, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Hold on here. Hold on. So you're saying that I can go there and receive the degrees in order over a longer period of time, digest them, understand them, rather than getting like three degrees over a weekend and I'm a 32nd degree? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and... It actually takes quite a long time, so uh, once awesome, you're initiated, <laughs> uh, it's about five months to be passed and then wow. seven months to be raised. After that, um, the English rites are a year apart. Um, the 14th and 18th are a year apart, and then the 30th degree, you've had to have been a master mason for 10 years. Um, and that's the minimum. Not everybody goes that Yeah, time, so. I mean, wow. that's, that's if you're doing everything right. Uh, and, and to get the 30th and 32nd degrees, you've had to you have to be a member of more than one lodge, and you've actually had to help form a new lodge. Uh, so you don't just get the degrees because you you throw some cash down and show up for. A, well, I'm out because I like to buy my degrees. <laughs> <laughs> Make it rain, Robert. Make it rain. <laughs> it's raining well, petitions. Yes. Uh, so, yeah. and so do you guys have like? One dues card or like the huge stack that I'm stuck, you know, with my George Costanza wallet. So, <laughs> is it just like one, one like organization, you know, where it's like it's just one organization. We got we got a Supreme Council, the 33rd degree. They rule the entire structure. I think he was asking about the dues structure. Dues? Well, you have to pay dues to each. No, lodge you belong to. Well, and, and actually, the whole over, overarching, yeah. So, yes, you, you'll still need your George Costanza wallet for that. <laughs> absolutely. That's just incredible, guys. I, I think it's absolutely fascinating. Now, you, you mentioned that um, you kind of, you said, 
a year between a couple of those degrees. Now, do you guys do all the degrees in between those as well, or is it like just those staple steps? Those are the degrees that you can take. And so when you like when you get the fourteenth, you would receive the fourth to the to to the fourteenth. But you're actually going through the fourteenth degree. Um, I mean, do you give degrees, the fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth, eleventh, twelfth, and thirteenth? Yes. Like you give all those in between too. You're given all of those, and then those we exemplify uh, at special logic research meetings so that people okay. can actually see those. Gotcha. But we're, we're way too small to put on every single degree. We, we would have to have numbers like you guys have. Our numbers aren't that good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so can you, can you talk about – so you talk about the building that you're in. Is that what's the official title of that? Is that the Grand Lodge of, of Co Masons, or or what's the official title of that building we're in? This is the library. Uh, well, <laughs> we just call it headquarters. HQ, got it. HQ. Uh, so one question that I did bring up in the green room that that I was curious about in some of my research, I I, I did see a big movement in uh, Le Droit Human, the that other Co Masonry group. How are you guys related to that or separate from that, uh, or is it complicated? It is complicated, but I'm going to let Karen answer that one. She can give well, us the history. Well, we were all together uncomfortably for generations. Um, the way I try and explain it to people, because I wasn't actually here for the unpleasantness, um, but for the entire time uh, we were aligned with Paris, there was a certain amount of push between us. For instance, they would send us an edict we didn't like, and so we would lose it. Or we would not understand enough French to do anything. Or there would be an excuse. This is called prevarication. And there was a lot of this going on on both sides. And what the French had to decide was, did they want to push us? Because if they pushed us, we might decide to leave. And so over the decades, they would either decide, okay, we're not going to push this one because we don't want to upset them, and the, we basically got away with a lot because there were no phones yet, no telegraphs, no internet, and things took months and months and months, and you know, grandmasters came and went, and we enjoyed a great deal of autonomy. Uh, in the 1980s, uh, there arose, for the first time, a group within our order that actually preferred to be aligned with Paris. There's nothing really wrong with that, except it's a different perspective. You have 70% of the brothers in the order who feel their first loyalty is to the American Federation of Human Rights, the body here in this country. And then you've got 30% who really feel their loyalty is in Paris. And we came, there's a whole lot of ugliness that happens, which we'll pass over because it could be its own book. Um, but it came to a head in the 1990s, and folks, um, folks like to know who left who. Officially, Le Droit Humain left us, but the way I try to explain that is we had already decided by then we wanted to be separated. They got to the divorce attorney first. That's yeah. all it means. Uh, they did leave first. They did found their new organization in Delaware, uh, incorporated in Delaware, and they operate separately from us, but it really, it's really an academic thing. We really weren't together at that point. It, what we needed was a legal separation, and it took a long time to get that legal separation, but we did finally get it. Question. The parent organization that you mentioned had the words human rights in it. Can you say it again and then explain how that... The American Federation um, of Human Rights. How does um, that the Masonic uh, structure or a masonry? Well, uh, actually the name um, has its roots in... Uh, what a lot of our early members were. Um, a lot of our early members were really into the uh, early labor movement of the early 20th century. And so words like federation, you know, that was that's a trigger word for yeah. some of these people. And because a lot of these people were in labor organizations of their own, some of them truly clandestine labor organizations, they wanted a name that was close to their hearts. So they said the Le Droit Humain means human rights. Okay. So, we could be, um, we can be Le Droit Humain American Federation, because federation is the word that Paris adopted for all of its federations later. 
And so what we decided to be was the American Federation of Human Rights because it sounded really nice to the early union members who made up a lot of the membership of our order. It doesn't mean quite as much today because we're really not much in the labor movement anymore. Uh, but the name has stuck. And so that's where that name comes from. Very cool. Thanks. And the relationship between these two bodies, how is it today? Uh, non-existent. Okay. Well, there you have it. No, but I mean, it's 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 just like you know, what is it? What is my relationship with Jason here? We still talk, but yeah. his Grand Lodge doesn't recognize my my order, and that's okay. Karen's awesome to talk to, so <laughs> I'm not going to stop. So let, let me pick up on something that you did say earlier, uh, Karen, which is uh, use the word brother. Yes. Uh, um, so do you? <laughs> I do to yes. to to male craft masons. Uh, what do you call? Well, wait a minute now. Is it a reference to your gender or is it a title? Ah, there we go. So because what... you are, I I meet some Freemason male craft Freemasons who are related to each other, but they mm -hmm. tend not to be. And so, if you're not brothers by blood, then how do you become brothers in a lodge if it's not a title? Oh, you've stomped him. Burn. <laughs> it's the same thing with us. It's a title. It has nothing to do with our gender. And and we, so we believe that if if we use the term sister, which we we used to in this organization, okay. but since our the split in the '90s, everyone's a brother. Uh, in fact, even in our ritual, everything everybody's referred to as a he, yeah. uh, whether man or woman. But like Karen said, we use it as a title, and we believe that it promotes ultimate equality because mm -hmm. if we were to divide people between brothers and sisters, you're still dividing people up. And so our goal is to to bring an ultimate unity. It's still a, it's still a distinction. Exactly. Yeah. No, that's that's very interesting because it, it makes me think of. When when you hear the political correctness uh, of of people writing, it makes it super clunky. When you hear someone, well, he or she could do this before he or she entered, blah blah blah. Uh, but there are people who are very passionate about making sure that that's there. Do you come across that within the members of your organization that want to that rather be called sisters, or or do you not do you not see that? I've never seen it. I've never seen it, and, and frankly, when uh, I'm interviewing a potential candidate uh, for the order, I'll uh, I'll ask them if they have a problem with that. Because if they mm. do, I'll recommend they shouldn't join. So, so, which actually makes one other thing that just kind of came to mind uh, more less of a barrier, which is kind of the transgendered issue, right? That that's kind of the logical thing when you talk about things like Caitlyn, Je Caitlyn Jenner in the news and so forth. <laughs> that. You know, if it just makes it easier that everyone gets the same title, you don't have to worry about he, she, somewhere in the middle. It's it's just all it's all on, on the level, right? Yes, absolutely. I, but I I do I can appreciate that from a sense of again the the way you said it was perfect is that it's one less thing to divide us. So I I want to ask a question that uh, is very. Uh, it's a it's it's probably a question that most people would consider just a dumb question, <laughs> but I'm going to ask it anyway. So, you know, we we were talking earlier. Jason and John wrote a great piece about uh, homosexuality within the lodge, right? Because a lot of guys are wow. they were against the idea of this because for whatever reasons, maybe it was religious or maybe they just felt uncomfortable with somebody being attracted in, in a lodge setting. Within co-masonry, is there a distraction or is it not a distraction or is it not even there, like between men and women in the same lodge? Uh, no such thing as a dumb question. So, um, Just dumb people. Just dumb people. I've been asked this question before, like, "Oh, do you go to Lodge Matthias?" And you know, you're checking out the lady masons, you know, on the other side of the room. And I'm like, "Well, just as much as I would if I went to church, you know." Uh, I mean, I mean we're... fair enough. So oh, yeah, I, I don't go to Lodge to pick up on chicks, you know. So I, I, mean, I go to Lodge to do. Something. Neither do I. Well, Neither do I. Good, John. <laughs> 
Um, but, but, you know, my wife's a, a co-Mason. So, and uh, my so mother's you... a co-Mason. And, and we're in the same lodge. So I got you got families in lodges. <laughs> You got spouses in lodges. You have girlfriend and boyfriends in lodges, and you got single people in lodges. And uh, okay, uh, so uh, you, since you went there, I got to go there, and I, I I did cue you to this. Is there uh, fraternization that goes on? He's married to a co-mason. Yeah, of course, there is. <laughs> Inherently, I am every I, night. So I, I, I had to <laughs> ask. Um, um, a little bit. I mean, it's 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 like any other organization. There, I mean, there's people that get together, but. You know that's a private matter, so it has nothing yeah. to do with it. Doesn't de- it doesn't detract from the experience? Is where I was really no. going. Okay. Not not in lodge, absolutely not. So, I mean, do you see what the women wear? I mean, no. I will jump in here uh, as master of my lodge. I do interview people, prospective members, and if um, <clears throat> if the prospective applicant says something that indicates to me that they would be distracted in lodge, that sort of indicates to me they're really not mature enough to be co-masons. Right. And I will refer them to a gender-based lodge. That's a good point. That's you know, interesting. I, I was also thinking about this, too, and thinking about that I had been a member of a Comasonic lodge, and I met my wife in lodge. Like, you know, if you meet your wife in church or your religious organization, you probably have, like, this really deep connection. And, I, I mean, I guess since you're married to... Uh, you know, a co-mason, you know, your your fellow a member of the lodge. Do you think? Do you find that there's like even a, a deeper and like more a bigger bond connection between you guys? Oh, absolutely. I mean, we go to lodge together, and we're both very very involved in the organization. So we we travel to other lodges together. Uh, you know, when she's you know getting ready to take her exam for the next degree, you know, I can help her or she can help me. And, uh, I mean, we can discuss all matters. And uh, um, at least in terms of my marriage, uh, yeah. it's probably the cement that keeps us together. That's awesome. So I've, I've got a question, guys. Um, travel. What, what is it like to, to travel? Because co-masonry is such a smaller organization than, than Mailcraft Masonry. Um, do you all still get a chance to travel? Um, I know you both went to France recently. Would you mind talking a little bit about that? Well, uh, just uh, before we give some experiences, our organization does things a little differently in terms of visitation. So, um, Mailcraft Masons visit our lodges all the time. Uh, they tell us not to tell anybody, and you know that, that they visited, but they come all the time. And uh, some of them come on a regular basis uh, in some of the Orients. But we basically, if you're a Mason, um, in in any sort of regular way, you know, not like the OTO or anything like that, but, uh, you know, the 50 Grand Lodges or uh, the Grand Lodge of England, we allow them to visit. And we allow our members, if Master Masons, to visit uh, any other Masonic organization, including the Grand Orient or any, you know, even though they don't hold the same values as we do. We do have a requirement for belief in a supreme power, so certain people can't become members of our organization, but visitation we're very laxed on. Um, that being said, me and Karen were both in Paris last month, and we visited several lodges of the Grand Orient, and it was a wonderful experience. Wow, that's fascinating. Can, well, that, that certainly raises a concern for me. Um, when you're going through the interview process and you're interacting with a potential candidate, you're paying close attention to the to their character, whether you suspect that they would um, get distracted by the uh, opposite gender or if they're going to be uh, genuinely uh, protective of the secrets. But then, if you have a brother that comes from another jurisdiction that doesn't recognize your order, wouldn't that isn't that a conflict, allowing them to sit in lodge with you? Because it shows that they're willing to violate their own obligations. I'm not in the habit of interpreting other people's obligations for them. I think it's inappropriate. Boom. (laughs) Wow. But wouldn't the inappropriateness of them violating their own obligation Again, I that that is their problem. Yeah. I I don't like it when someone tells me what my obligation is, and it's really not appropriate for me to tell anyone else. And so for me to even make an internal judgment about that is just wrong. Yeah. Mm. 
-hmm. you know, and, and, it, and it will vary from master to master of lodge. So um, when I was master of my lodge, I had a gentleman um, in Salt Lake City who uh, decided to join because he was homosexual and he was being discriminated in his lodge. And um, I said, well, if you'd like to join, I think you should choose which, you know, which organization you want to be part of. And he made a decision to demit from the Grand Lodge of Utah and to join uh, a Comasonic Lodge. Yeah, Nick, but, you had a question? Yeah, I actually I kind of, a, I'm, I'm going to go in a completely opposite direction. But, uh, you know, I was, I, I've done a little bit of research into, well, a lot, a lot of research. But anyway, um, in, in reading about uh, co-freemasonry and co-masonry, it, it seems like, <clears throat> it, you know, because it comes from that continental side, that there might be a little bit more focus on social change or things like that. Do you guys engage in any kind of political, social change or anything like Because I know in, in a lot of, you know, I don't know, maybe that doesn't exist in co-masonry, but, you know, I know other organizations, the Grand Orient seems to be very focused on certain things like that, so I didn't know if this was similar. Okay. Um, uh, no, we don't do that. We don't uh, just we don't do politics. We don't do religion. You're mm. correct. Uh, that is sort of an indication of uh, continental influence. But again, there was an ocean between us and them. And mm -hmm. there, if you go through the archives, there are many, many times that they wanted us to adopt a lot of this stuff, and yeah. we resisted it repeatedly. We don't have any point in our history or we're politically active. Um, we, I think the closest we ever came was Louis, Louis Wazoo, one of our founders. Somebody asked him who he would like to see as president. And so he kind of said, oh, it, it turned into an endorsement. Um, <laughs> and it ended up in the newspaper. And it was, yeah, it was a mess. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But that was more of a whoops. That was, that's not yeah, something yeah. we're officially done. And, well, and, are also, you know, if I could just add to oh, that sure, real quick, sure, um, you know, in our lodges, we uh, we don't do any business really. Um, we have a pretty elaborate opening, um, and and we have a preliminary ceremony. We do processions, uh, lighting of the candles. We we do sensing in our lodges, um, and once we open, um, you know, besides reading like applications of candidates or things like that, it's all educational. So, you know, we're either doing some sort of um, festival, like you know, honoring the summer solstice or the winter solstice, uh, or if someone's reading a paper and there's a discussion lodge on the, on the symbolism um, of, that, uh, of that paper. But we don't do any business. We don't do any politics. It's purely educational, our organization. But how do you get your pancake breakfasts in order? <laughs> no pancake breakfast here. I'm sorry. That's it. That's that's the reason why co-masonry is so small. <laughs> that's funny. Uh, and, and, then, and waistline as as well as in number of members. Yeah. Uh, here's another question I had, and you know, obviously I'm going down this, you know, going following that continental strain, which I know is an ocean between, so I should ignore it. But now, <clears throat> you know, in, in in our well, in the one the hosts different things. Uh, our different Grand Lodges, you know, it's, it's restricted to men who have a belief in a supreme being. Is that is that similarly held also in uh, co-masonry as well? Yes. Matthias uh, mentioned earlier, yes, we require belief in a supreme being. Okay. <laughs> We're probably, I mean, it's, the wording is a supreme power in our constitution. Oh, sorry. Sure. So it's, it's probably more laxed because we have a lot of people from different religions or people right. that are not say of any religion, maybe deists, whatnot. So we're probably a little more liberal with what would be considered. So by definition, it's belief in a higher power. Higher power. Okay. It doesn't have so, to be. A and do you do you use the G, denoting deity? We do not use the G. We use a five-pointed star with a, a yod in the middle. Wow, interesting. That's hey, awesome. so so let me uh, let me kind of cut you off there. It's getting kind of late in the hour, and then uh, I'll ask if there's one final like a thing you did not cover that you wish other people knew about co-masonry. So I'll, I'll let you kind of 
say one last piece, and then we'll go around for final thoughts and shameless plugs. Karen, Matthias, anything you wanted to add that, that we didn't cover yet? Oh, are we both getting our la the last? Oh. Yes. Here you oh go. My. I really don't have any idea. Anything uh, that we didn't cover that you wish people knew about Code Masonry in general? Yeah, I, you know, there's something <laughs> I'd like to add because I know a lot of Mailcraft Masons, and uh, we've had a lot of discussions over the years, and, and one thing that comes up all the time is um, I, they think Co-Masons are trying to get Mailcraft Masons to recognize us or uh, that we want you guys to accept women. That's the farthest thing from the truth. We really don't care what you guys are doing. We, we very much respect the fact that lives can be only men or only women or mixed, and we believe there should be the freedom to choose which organization you're in. So by no means do we want uh, to change your organization um, and if you don't ever recognize us, we frankly don't care. It doesn't make one bit of difference to us. Uh, it, it would be nice, I suppose, but uh, uh, we'll go on our own way um, with or without you guys. I, I would jump in and say that there actually is choice, whether it is recognized or not. Mm -hmm. uh, there, you know, there's. I, I say it in a bunch of places that Freemasonry is triune in nature. There's male craft masonry, female craft masonry, and mixed or co-masonry. And it's a system we know can work largely because it does. There you go. All right, so let's uh, let's hand it off to Robert Johnson to start sending us home with uh, final thoughts and shameless plugs. So, Robert, what have you got? Just wow, man! <laughs> it was so cool. Um, I've been so curious about this for so long. Um, in fact, um, in the beginning when I first started podcasting. Um, the guy I took all my cues from uh, was a podcaster, and you guys might know him. His name is, uh, well, I'm not going to say the name. I'll just say um, the, the podcast, which th was the Digital Freemason, Brother Scott. And he had had some inklings um, on, I can't remember if it was the social media or if it was on his website about his thoughts about um, co-masonry. And... I don't know if he ever joined or not, and I, I always was like, I, I had thought about it at the time, and I was like, why would you do that? You know, I was very new to masonry, three, four months in, and um, you know, as as I've grown as a mason uh, to understand, you know, what we teach, and uh, one of the first things that we're told in a lodge, right, is where were you first prepared to be a mason? Well, that no, that answer knows no gender, right? So. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's just a very interesting concept, and I was so excited for this episode because uh, when do I, when am I going to get the chance to do this, right? And uh, you guys really delivered. Um, I can't thank you guys enough for being on the program, and really, it was just exceptional. I learned so much, and uh, you know, I'd love to call you guys brothers all day long. So thank you so much. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. Yeah, Robert, uh, go ahead, Jason. Robert, Robert, I do have to say, uh, you know, that that question, where are you first uh, prepared to be made a Mason, is probably only a problem if you're a Time Lord. <laughs> <laughs> Doctor Who's not that great, Jason. Stop. Yes, yes. Thank you. Oh, thank Josh. You. <laughs> yes, good job, Jason. Hey, Robert. Thanks for everything you do with uh, your podcast and uh, yeah, yeah. conversations with Fred Rowe. That's awesome. Thanks, guys. Mm -hmm. All right, let's hand it off to Nick with the Millennial Freemason. Sure. Uh, you know, I, this has been a very, uh, very great... Uh, I, I don't know what to say. Uh, it's been very fun. It's been very interesting. It's, it's great to finally uh, meet the person who uh, wrote a book that I, I recommend to as many people as I can because it's, it's, it's one of my favorites. And what book um, is that, Nick? Which one? Uh, that would be that one, Haunted Chambers. It actually is. I, I have, I have both copies, the Kindle and the regular version. So, yes, I'm a fanboy. I guess I don't know. Uh, but uh, uh, anyway, um, yeah, I, this has been a great conversation. I've learned a lot, and I usually ask one question that I forgot to ask. But do you guys have swords in any of your degrees? <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, from the 18th degree up, you have to have a sword. Sweet. Petitions will be coming, Nick. They're there. They're there. 
have scum. I have a sword addiction, so I, I have to I have to work on that. But uh, you, you can check out my Freud blog. Would say about that. Yeah, that, that is true. <laughs> Sometimes a cigar is just a cigar. Wait, <laughs> never. Uh, anyway, uh, we'll but you can also head uh, on over to reddit.com slash r slash freemasonry, and you guys are more than welcome to join in the conversation. Sadly, uh, some of Mailcraft uh, doesn't know how to necessarily deal with it and deal with, well, anything that isn't within their provincial tiny little world. Um, but That's you are more than welcome to show up, come on out. Yeah, and uh, I will upvote. So come on over. Uh, Tom, Acousti, and I are, are mods over there as well as some others. So come on out, hang out, and have some fun. So reddit.com slash r slash remakes. All right, thank you, Nick, Thanks. for everything you do. Nick, uh, let's see, moving on to Juan. Juan Sepulveda. This is an episode that has been over a year in the making. Yeah. First started as a, oh, what if one day we could, and here, here you are. You know, here we have Jason all the way out there meeting the two of you, and I think that's fantastic. We got a chance to, to, to make it happen. Um, there were no stupid questions, I think. Right? Love you, Robert. Very I'm inquisitive idiots. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, the people that listen to, to our program and that watch our, our, our program, they're going to have all kinds of questions, and they're not here to ask them. We have to ask all these questions. Some people have absolutely no idea that there is a, such a thing as co-masonry, and other people, like some of the panelists here, are true fans of the books, so... You know, it's it's been very interesting. I thank you both for joining us tonight and and taking the time to to be so hospitable to Jason. And for for myself, I've I've learned a lot. I look forward to having more conversations later on. And I invite everybody to to listen to the Winding Stairs. I have an episode. I recorded half of it today. Yes, and I'm very excited about it. And Last but not least, the reason I, it took me over a month to record the Winding Stairs episode is that I have wor I was working on The Gentleman's Brotherhood. And we need to bring manners back and make sure that courtesy is common again. So go to thegentlemansbrotherhood.com. Thank you very much, Juan, for everything you do. My pleasure. I'll hand it off to Jason. And anything else that, uh, uh, the folks out there want to add to the conversation? Uh, so this is this has been uh, an amazing show, and I just wanted to thank again uh, Karen and, and Matthias for just joining us in the discussion and just spreading spreading light about uh, something that that a lot of Mailcraft Masons really know nothing about. And I, I especially want to to thank Matthias and his wife uh, for just you know treating me like family, um, better than family uh, for the time that I've I've been here. They've They've been absolutely wonderful, and I just can't thank them enough. Um, as far as, as co-masonry is concerned, if, if there are women who want to be masons, I am so, so glad that there is an organization that allows them to have those very same rights and benefits as, uh, as male and, and male craft masons are, are concerned. I, I think, you know, yes, people say, well, you know, women masons, isn't that the Eastern Star? And no, it's it's not the same thing at all. And I think uh, I think the Eastern Star has has one purpose, but co masonry has a, a completely different purpose and fills a completely different void. And and in that sense, I th I think it's a very useful organization, and I'm glad it's around. Mm -hmm. And uh, so thanks thanks everybody for for watching. Uh, you know, subscribe to us on on YouTube and buy some pins. John and I will be at the MRF Symposium. Come and see us. Say hi. And uh, is there anything else that uh, Brother Karen or Brother Matthias you would like to say? Uh, thank you for having us on the show. It's been wonderful. Uh, you're a nice group of guys. Thank you for having me again. All right. Thank you very much. Book club episode. Book club. Yeah, that's right, true. We'll, we'll, pass <laughs> we'll pass it back to you, John. Thank you very much, Jason and uh, Karen and Matthias. Hey, look, so, you know, kind of the final conclusion I had on this is, 
Yes, our Grand Lodge considers you two both clandestine masons. We have a whole entire episode on, on clandestine masonry. Uh, but as we said then, and as we concluded then, and as I'll repeat now, just because our organizations may treat things as separate, uh, you know, we definitely should continue to extend, you know, courtesy, uh, love, and, and respect for our fellow human beings. Uh, this has been a, a purely uh, an enlightening episode from an academic perspective. I've learned so much from from you from you both. You know, thank you very much for joining us on this show. And so, um, just because uh, we we have again political, you know, organizational political differences, uh, doesn't mean we can't learn a lot from each other on our methods or behaviors and, and how we operate. So again, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, thank you for the other hosts. And I wanted to make sure that we um, <clears throat> uh, we'll, we'll try to add into the show notes uh, of the paper that that you wrote, Karen. Uh, regarding the difference between AOS and and co-masonry, and so we'll uh, we'll throw that into our show notes, so people are familiar with your writings and your thoughts on on the difference there. So uh, that's all I have. Thank you very much for watching, and keep searching for more light. Have a good night. Thank you. Well, Nick and I were both there. We had pancakes beforehand. <laughs> Wow. Alrighty. I think I think we've definitely uh, oh, man. killed that dead horse. So, uh, speaking of, a, of other depressing satanic news, Nick, why don't you lead us off with the Masonic Monday question <laughs> on Tuesday. On Tuesday. Welcome to hell. <laughs> anyway. Alright. How bad am I? Am I lagging for that? Anyway. Yeah, doesn't matter. Alright, the answer Samuel Colt. Good old Sam Colt, who was famous for patenting the revolving cylinder pistol and also the assembly line model for its production, using interchangeable parts. And we had a whole bunch of people, <clears throat> interestingly enough, most of you guys said you despise guns. Just kidding. Uh, but anyway, uh, I will read off the names really quickly. Christopher Croteau, Justin Miller... Uh, Greg Guffey, Willem Kosin, uh, there we go, uh, Robert Johnson, well, who's that guy? Slacker. Jared Chalensky, uh, Simon Dick, huh? I said Cowan. Uh, Christopher Dorset, Jared C Chapman, Dale Allen, Lou Bedford, Steve Higdon, Daniel Sells, Carl Walker, Joey Bo Boer, Ted Service, James Webb, Dustin Fields, Kevin Schwartz, Josh Ney, Will Fowler, Walter Zalea, Shane Cody, Chris Eckert, the second, Kyle Rowe, Luke Zale, Johnny Z. Jonathan Primo, and then two under-the-wire guys, and it's taken forever to get there, uh, but you know who you are. No, just kidding. Uh, we have Blake Miles Leach and Joseph Land. So, great job, guys. All right, now we'll get into the question. Make it harder next time. Oh, man. Well, yeah, this, this, one was a little, this one's a little bit more tough. So, Masonic Monday question for the week of July 27, 2015. Albert Magnus, or Albert the Great, was a Dominican friar, bishop, and learned scholar during the Middle Ages. Because of his extensive writings on Aristotle, chemistry, astronomy, he was elevated to fabled status. Many alchemical writings were attributed to him, to him as well as many legends of dubious origin. One such legend involved the designing and construction of this cathedral. The legend says that Albert Magnus was visited by four men carrying four implements of architecture and design, after which the Virgin Mary appeared, and the four men laid out their work for Albert Magnus. And it is with this design that the cathedral was constructed. Your question, which cathedral is Albert Magnus said to have designed? And what four implements were the men of his vision carrying? 
When you have an answer, send it to MasonicMonday at gmail.com. Don't forget to include your lodge name, your lodge number, and the hashtag uh, Magic Man. Back to you, Jason. Uh, hey, back to you, John. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> hey, you said you're running this thing. <clears throat> no, no, no. Let's uh, let's get started. So, yeah, home masonry. This is this is a show that we've wanted to do uh, since basically the beginning of the Masonic Roundtable because it's it's a very interesting branch of masonry about which the vast majority of of mailcraft masons out there know very little. So this this is a, a great opportunity to there was a uh, there was a really cool article on um, the Orange County California Freemasons that are staging a comeback thanks to millennials and it's talking about the the growth of of Masonic um, organizations in in California with the resurgence of, of kind of the the millennial generation uh, becoming much more interested in in masonry after the the baby boomers. Uh, you know, kind of went to other ways with that. So it was a really neat article, and it's been shared around social media. What's I great about that is the lodge in Orange County, California. And Orange Circle is the lodge that I first walked up to, and I was actually going to uh, petition there, but I chickened out like a punk. <laughs> <laughs> but it was so cool because right next door to it is like an old-school barber shop, and uh, it, it's such a cool place down in Orange, uh, in Orange Circle down there, or Old Town Orange, California. And uh, so if you guys are ever walking around and you're in California, you're in the California area, stop by there. It's really cool. I did really like the, uh, the opening statement. I was going to say that. About, uh, that's where we sacrifice the goats because I was actually at the Grand Lodge <laughs> of New York a couple weeks ago and I got to play tour guide because the tour guide didn't show up. And... Uh, there was actually a, a point where one of the people was like, so where do you sacrifice the virgins? And I pointed to the altar, and I just went on like a, a five-minute diatribe about how we're getting away from virgins because they're really hard to find, and then the goats were just messy, so now it's more symbolic, and it, it was just awesome. From operative to speculative, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <clears throat> So that happened. Now we just let them watch a video. <laughs> <laughs> and I refer you back to the Baphomet episode last week. Uh, Northern uh, Masonic Jurisdiction sacrificial video. Yes. <laughs> That's great. <clears throat> All right, uh, next topic we have, unless there's any other discussion, is on the, uh, let's see what we got here, the Short Talk Bulletins. Uh, for those who know about the Masonic Service Association, uh, there has been a brother who has taken upon himself, uh, under the authority of the Masonic Service Association, to go back and record audio <clears throat> of the old short talk bulletins. Uh, and Isn't so, that basically the Whence Came You Masonic podcast? <laughs> yeah, take hey, take it all paper, <laughs> dust it off, <laughs> and read it. I'm not, not to take anything away from the MSA. They do some fantastic things with this, but I just want to say, you know, if you don't want to give anything per year, you can just watch... Or you can listen to my show, and maybe you'll get a MSA. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's really funny, you know, reading this article because they they say that you know paying for this and supporting this goes directly to support the MSA, but they crouch it in a way where it's supporting the ideals and values of the MSA, and it doesn't say anything about supporting the MSA monetarily. No, if you're gonna oh, if you're gonna record these these short talk bulletins and this intellectual property, uh, you know, I want to make sure that the money that's generated from it is actually going back into the MSA. Yeah, for sure. Well, if you want to do that, then you got to buy the, the little starter pack that John didn't like. What's the starter pack? <laughs> that pack of books that you didn't enjoy. <laughs> well, that's, that's true. <laughs> that's true. Yeah, the, yeah, the the one they sold. Uh, we've talked about that on a previous episode about their. Uh, <laughs> the Masonic Speakers Pack. That's it. Yeah, that's what it was. Oh yeah, that's right. Uh, you know, so so how do you guys feel about this? Uh, charging money for basically recording uh, public domain stuff. I don't know. It, it, again, I'm with you, Jason. If I knew it was if it was directly going to a good cause, uh, you know, I could upscale that. 
Uh, I did check it out. Uh, the audio is high quality. <clears throat> it is well recorded, so there's not a lot of uhs and ums and all that mixed in. Uh, but definitely want to uh, consider how often he's going to update this. It, they, they do go through a, a an app called... Good evening, and welcome back to the Masonic Roundtable, a weekly hangout of Masons from around the world who get together to talk about Masonic news and opinions in a friendly and social manner. The standard disclaimer applies for this episode. The thoughts and opinions expressed here are solely the opinions of the participants and do not um, reflect any Grand Lodge statements or positions. Please keep your conversations open to the public and on the level for this episode. Uh, tonight, as usual, you can interact with us uh, by sending us a tweet at Mason Roundtable at our Twitter handle or uh, posting on the Facebook event page, and we'll get to social media later in the episode. Uh, as far as introductions are concerned, my name is Jason Richards, and I am the junior warden of Acacia Lodge number 16 in good old Clifton, Virginia. John, you next. Thank you, Jason. I see you have a few others that I assume you will introduce later. So with That's that, correct. Uh, my name is John Ruark. I'm a past master of the Patriot Lodge number 1957 in super awesome Fairfax, Virginia. Ish. Illinois. And I'll hand it off to Robert Johnson. And you're muted, Robert, so let's let's fix I that first. I was totally muted in prep for the show. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Uh, Robert Johnson here from Waukegan, Illinois, uh, the current worshipful master of Waukegan Lodge number 78 in up-and-coming again Waukegan, Illinois. Twice in one era. Yeah, right. why not? How about you, Nick? Hi, uh, Nick Johnson, past master of Corinthian Lodge number 67 in Big Time Farmington. Thank you, Nick. And Juan? Hello, everybody. Juan Sepulveda here from Kissimmee, Florida, member of Orange Blossom Lodge number 80, and the host of the Winding Stairs Freemasonry podcast. All right. And now back to you, Jason. Uh, yes. Uh, so this is our episode on American co-masonry. And I'd like to turn it over to uh, uh, Brother Matthias first to introduce himself and, and what he is with the order. Uh, thank you, uh, Jason. Um, my name is Matthias Kumsia. I'm the past master of uh, Enoch Lodge number 19 out of uh, Salt Lake City. And uh, currently I'm the uh, president of the Grand Council of Administration. Um, basically I'm the uh, glorified uh, office manager of the Honorable Order of American Co-Masonry. <clears throat> And then uh, our second guest with us uh, is Brother Karen Kidd. Yes. Please introduce yourself. I'm Karen Kidd. I am Right Worshipful Master of Shemesh Lodge <laughs> number 13 under, dis excuse me, under Dispensation Meeting in the Orient of Seattle, Washington, and I've written some books. Some pretty fantastic books, actually. Very good. All right. Masonic news, then. Uh, we have quite quite a bit this week, so let's get right to it. Um, again, if you have not registered yet, the clock is ticking. Jason and I will be at the 6th Annual MRF Symposium, that's the Masonic Restoration Foundation Symposium, at the Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania in the city of brotherly love, Pennsylvania. And so that will be at the end of August. Hope to see you there. Uh, you can check out show notes and or go to MasonicRestorationFoundation.org on how to register uh, to Go to that, so hope to see you there. And, uh, John, we will actually have a table with the vendors at the MRF Symposium. So come and say hi. Come and talk to us about the show. We will give you some bookmarks and bring your Masonic passports because if you've ever gotten a thank you card from us, we hand emboss all of our thank you cards, and I will have that embosser with me, and I will give you a stamp in your Masonic passport for TMR. <clears throat> nice. So... There's a little something you could take away that no one else has. <laughs> All right, the next topic that we have is uh, something that uh, I saw and Jason saw um, about the Orange County uh, Freemasons. I want you to talk about that a little bit, Jason. Oh yeah, there. <laughs> he doesn't have the poodle hat. That's, That's the problem. <laughs> you have to have the menacing poodle hat. You should have a piece. It's totally a, a Ren Faire knockoff, but yeah. Hey man, we just got back from the Ren Faire. I got sweet killed. I've actually made a Knight Templar costume. Really? Yes. 
Alrighty. <clears throat> That's awesome. <laughs> <One of them. laughs> so now you can uh, start hanging out outside of recruiting centers. Then. No, I don't. It wasn't for me. It was for somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> for someone else to yes. dodge bullets. And, and, he, look at has, and like, he has yes, worn it to lunch. Oh, and Nick, what do you, what have you got there? Oh, oh that is oh, your night Templar. Nick's chapeau. His chapeau? Handsome. Handsome Nick. Oh. That Nick doesn't even <clears throat> use because they have their class A's. That's right. So... Uh, do keep in mind, guys, that for those listeners of the show, yes, we will be doing a Knights Templar episode eventually. <laughs> and we'll see all of Nick's many hats. <laughs> and swords. <laughs> so, yeah, so back back to the, uh, the Knight Templar dude. Um, good for him, but that's that's really the, the loosest connection to Freemasonry there. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know if he's a Mason. It's still <clears throat> kind of hilarious. Well, one thing, though, is like, I don't know if you noticed at the... A Freemasonry group, the the Whitney Stitch Freemasonry group. Some people were really offended that I put that uh, that post up. Really? Because I put and in Templar news, and I put the link. That was it. Discuss discuss among yourselves. <laughs> and people, a, a lot of brothers became very angry. Like, what does this have to do with Freemasonry? Other people were very uh, boisterous about the fact. Well, people are going to be thinking bad about the fraternity now that this man is doing that. So you have two camps. You have people that were completely convinced that we are directly related to the, to the Knights Templar and thus making this a Masonic news, and other people that said this has nothing to do with Masonry. How dare you put this on your own page? Wow. Alrighty. A lot of people learn, including me. So let's see. The last thing I want to get to tonight before we get into the meat and potatoes is the, the big news about our old buddy Baphomet. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> this uh, you, you guys couldn't make this up, and you couldn't have done it any sooner. Um, let's talk about Baphomet. Um, oh, in yeah. Detroit this week, right after our episode, yes, we had something to do with it, apparently, is uh, the new statue unveiling in, in Detroit of the Satanic Temple's secret Baphomet monument unveiling. You can see a nice picture there of Baphomet with uh, two children who are... Very happy to be there, hanging out with him, <laughs> as most children are. Uh, you know, it's it's so it's, awkward. It is awkward. It really is. So but, Art de Hoyos. I want a mini here. About that. You guys see it? Yeah, Art de Hoyos posted about it. It it, it quickly made it made its way around the uh, uh, the Masonic forums. Uh, but I mean, it, it's it's really interesting, and most of the the comments I've seen really relate back to it's really. I wouldn't say ironic that basically that the 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 U.S. Satanists Satanists have actually taken Baphomet as a symbol and icon for for the Satanic Church when it really has has a very 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 loose connection to what they they, well, they truly believe. It, it, any any horrible group, and I'm not saying Satanists are horrible people because most of them are just plain old people who are atheists, but they're trolls. <laughs> you, you get a troll around, you know. So, but uh, look at like uh, any organization who adopts a symbol that's viewed upon negatively, they can take it, and now all of a sudden it's evil for everybody, right? Uh, so, yeah, whatever. But I was. Did you read? Two hundred people showed up for the unveiling. It was huge. Big party. I, this was, I was there. Yeah, and they they sold tickets well, to it actually. This is the tr- so, so if you're I mean, that's if you're, what it is. They're, they're, they're like, you know what? Satan's gonna get us there. You know, yeah, if your lodge, if your lodge is a uh, fundraising event, <laughs> roll out your own statue. Gum Road, that's mm. basically a content app, <clears throat> and so you'll you'll get all the updates inside of that app. What's What's kind of interesting, I think, about that whole idea is um, giving money to support them. If it was going to them, like you said. Uh, I would feel good with that uh, because obviously you can't run an organization like the MSA for free. Um, but ultimately, I feel like it kind of comes down to uh, if you really want to provide it, you can just provide it. And I think that's what they did it, the way they did it was listen for nothing or, or you know, give a dollar. Uh, it was like when Wentz came, you came to a point where the people that provided the app for us, uh, it was going to continue to be $2 for somebody to buy the app. You could support the show that way. But the way they changed it was actually 
that if we were going to continue with the paid app, it was going to be a subscription service for the listeners. Now, personally, I couldn't ask all the listeners to pay $2 every month for access to the show unlimited. Um, while I think if my time is well worth that $2, yeah, absolutely. But the craft gave me something I'm giving back. My two cents. Yeah, yeah in, in that case, it, it would be... In that case, it, it's a paid app switch. You're trapping them free and then switching it on them and charging. Yeah. I, I, you know me. I have, for, I, I think about this differently. Yeah, uh, I think you brothers are looking at it in a certain way. If, if it's a company or if it's an individual who has to take out of his time to record this, and he's gonna take the time to to record it, if some money goes to him, so so be it. It's not like they're charging a specific amount for them, right? Yeah, right. it's pay as I you think will. Something. Pay as you wish, right? Exactly. You know, it's it's the whole it's the cold play model, right? Yeah, I'm I'm fine if zero dollar zero dollars go to to the Masonic uh, Association. Zero dollars go to it, and all the money goes to help someone take time out of their life to record these in high quality, so the rest of the craft can benefit from it. I support it. I don't see a problem with that. There you go. Do you think now you know Juan's opinion. Is That's my opinion. At, at the, at the oh, sorry, Juan, we, we lost you there. Like, yeah. <laughs> like, all right. Because <laughs> we can't. We the thing is this: we can't have it both ways. You know, he we we complain about lodges having the crappiest websites, and the most. You know, they have a website up for a month or for a year, and then it goes down to nothing. No one maintains it. Yeah, because someone's doing it for free. How long are they going to do it for free? You know, we want something that looks nice. I bet you there's people on a payroll at the uh, Freemasonry magazine from California, which is the one of the most beautiful looking magazines. I bet you someone's getting money from that. Sure. So one one thing that I, I did, and I'll, a full disclosure, I, I put the zero dollars in just to see what the quality was like. I, I, I want to find a way if I can go back and actually up that a little bit um, because it is high quality and is is done with care. So. Um, Is it done in 320 kilobytes per second dual channel stereo? Dude, no <laughs> compression. It's awesome. <laughs> well, <laughs> all hey, right. We should, uh, we should move on and talk we about some guy beat. dressing up as a Templar. We have beat that dead horse. So speaking of of riding dead horses, uh, we've got <laughs> <laughs> we've got a guy who likes to dress up himself. Let's talk about this. The uh, uh, Man dons Knight Templar costume to scare away Muslims from a New York military recruiting center. Apparently, sh shootings at recruiting centers are uh, a common thing. Unfortunately, not anymore. <laughs> but but if you if you approach this guy, uh, you'll you'll think twice. So <laughs> yeah. Why it's is this Masonic in the blank to bring a sword to a gunfight? <laughs> it, 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 like... I don't. Know. I mean, I think this guy might actually yeah. encourage. Him. You know, like to, to do Makes something. sense to me. Yep. Well, and, and as Karen was mentioning, she's like, that's not a nice Templar costume. He's got the flag. Yeah. 